and put the question in the chat and she will or I will uh, she will pick it up. Um, the if the in the end the questions uh, will be uh, will be there and you the idea is to have 40 to 45 minutes of Anna's presentation followed by question and answer session. You can you can put the questions in the chat or you can raise your hands and we can pick up those questions. Uh, I will introduce Anna now and then I will hand over the the, the presentations to her. Anna is a senior research fellow in K, uh, in KMI. Uh, I know her for a long time and she has been involved in really interesting projects over the years. I always wanted her to have the presentation with IKD, <coughs> IKD and IDDI platform because I thought there is a uh, Anna, some of Anna's work has sits in the boundaries between uh, the STEM work and the social sciences research. So today Anna is going to present uh, work uh, from one of her projects, which is the title of her presentation is from passive viewing to active listening, collective intelligence technologies for peace building education in Rwanda. Um, Anna, over to you now uh, and I will switch off my, my uh, one more announcement I have to make that this recording, uh, this um, seminar is recorded. So if any of you have any objections with that, then you just sign in as an anonymous. So your name will not be get recorded. Uh, in, in the in the in your you will not be appearing in the in the uh, recording as uh, uh, with your name on it. Uh, if any other if there is no other question, then I will hand over to Anna um, and Anna will give you warning 10 minutes before your time is over and uh, then uh, we will take the questions. In there. OK, over to you Anna. Thank you very much, Dinar. I will try to share and hello everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today with you and I am trying now to see if I can share my screen and show some slides. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, Anna, I, we can see your screen. Yeah. Great. Interestingly enough, while I see my slides, I cannot see you guys, so that's OK. We, please just jump in if you want to tell or ask something, because I cannot see the chat at the moment. I, I will so, keep an eye on the chat. Yeah, but it was also nice. Anyone can just jump in and, yep. and ask. Um, OK, so today um, so I want to talk about my research on collective intelligence technologies and specifically for active listening and critical thinking in highly dividing context. Um, a little bit about KMI if we have external participants. So KMI is a very uh, international R&D lab at the Open University and for the people at the OU uh, that don't know we are sitting at the fourth floor of the Perel building in the Milton Keynes campus so uh, whenever life goes back to normal uh, I would be really happy to meet any of you there or anywhere on campus you like. This is my lovely research team and uh, what we basically do is uh, we investigate the theories, the methods and the enabling uh, new technologies uh, to uh, let collective image, intelligence emerge. So uh, collective intelligence, uh, it's a very vague and uh, usually common, but uh, uh, commonly used concept, which is actually something quite simple in my understanding, is, uh, is basically uh, a process through which uh, different peoples or groups, small to large, can uh, actively, uh, you know, engage in interaction and make collective decisions uh, or collective action in a much more intelligent way than they would do in isolation. So collective intelligence research are just trying to understand how we can enable uh, better um, better interaction between people so that they can collaboratively, collaboratively act in a more intelligent way. In this context, I have I have a specific focus on what uh, we define contested collective intelligence, which is a specific type of collective intelligence which is needed in a particularly complex social technical context in which basically some of the assumption of collective intelligence theories don't stand. 
for example, in which there are very uh, um, different point of view uh, uh, at stake, in which people need to collaborate in continuous awareness of each other's and understanding of each other uh, feeling, thinking or actions. Uh, basically, in very complex socio-technical uh, uh, context in which people need to talk to each other, collaborate to, make it, to better make sense of the problems that they need to address. So in this type of uh, context, uh, uh, classic aggregative CI approaches, they don't really work. And we need a different type of CI technologies that help enable uh, this sorts of a more uh, intelligent collective action. So in the in the last 10 years, my research group had developed a lot of different collective intelligence tools. Today, I'm just going to talk about one of them. Uh, but what all these tools have in common is basically that uh, they all are trying uh, to improve sense making and critical thinking during the process of collaboration through which the collective intelligence of the group emerge. So I'm going to be focusing on critical thinking and sense making and uh, trying to uh, just open the conversation with you to argue how important this is, especially nowadays in our society. So. Critical thinking is really important because as, as much as we can see in anything we do, much of our thinking is often very biased from our experience, our knowledge, our background, our inner unconscious bias, um, and it can be very partial, uninformed, it could become prejudice, and yet the quality of our thinking is really related to the quality of how we interpret our emotion, our experience, and, and then drive our action. And this is specifically important in collaborative contexts in which our action can actually affect quite a lot of other people's actions. So critical thinking, uh, it's basically uh, a concept that represents how we can do and think in a more critical and reflective way um, by making more reasoned judgments. Uh, but despite the word reasoned, this concept as is not just a cons conceptual rational uh, concept and uh, critical thinking is by far not a rational dynamic. It varies according to the motivation that are the underlying the thinking is never universal. It depends on the individual experience and is also almost a skill and disposition that we need to exercise all along our, our life. So, um, so it's not only rationality, but there is a very important affective dimensions that basically includes the feeling, the volition that are really necessary to have high quality reasoning and problem solving in a collective space. So in, in kind of in summary, our approach to collective intelligence really interpret uh, intelligence persons or groups as, uh, as uh, this sort of organism that don't act in, into an unemotional uh, wasteland, but they are committed individual, mindful person, full of passion, high value, but also with a strong capability to think critically, reflect, and also change assumptions and behavior when that is needed. So if we look at uh, Glazier's seminar paper on critical thinking applied to, uh, to the educational context, we can see that there is a very strong affective dimension in this process. So it's a process that starts from recognizing problem and, uh, and the attempt, a concrete attempt to find workable solution to this. And then uh, the trying to gather, marshal, validate information and evidence while at the same time recognizing uh, not only our own assumption and value, but also other people's assumption as a value. Um, it includes the capability to assess evidence, evaluate argument, test conclusion, and then make generalization through which we can kind of reconstruct and examine our own partner, patterns of personal beliefs. 
so that can inform a better understanding of, on the problem in a very um, critical thinking uh, uh, um, oriented process. So uh, in a way, um, despite kind of critical thinking, emotional intelligence and our capability to act and change as a collective, it's, uh, it, it brings together all this type of uh, feeling, emotion, but also capability to reason uh, and judge in a much more reflective way. And um, and so the main question that we have, you know, all across our research and in particular discussed today, is that is is really critical thinking a recognized value and skill in our modern society and most importantly do we really have some technology that can facilitate the emergence the exercise the practice of critical thinking in our highly dividing context and society so um, of course this is all kind of our inner answer is not really that much technologies help that and possibly uh, it is a kind of, uh, of, of value or, or capabilities that it, it, may, need, it may not be really appreciated uh, in general in society. So we look in particular in, at, uh, at the case of peace building education and a very dividing post-war context in, uh, in uh, Rwanda. Uh, and in particular, we will be looking at a specific type of technologies and multimedia narrative interaction tools uh, that basically can be used by NGOs uh, to build, uh, to promote a different way to interact, make sense and reflect on, uh, on digital storytelling and video archival material. So, uh, we run a user study in Rwanda uh, with the help of King's College London and the Aegis Trust uh, inside a EU project called ISOCO, Fountain of Peace. And, um, and, uh, and what we really did working with Aegis Trust uh, was uh, trying to find out how we could use uh, video archival material that the Trust had developed about uh, the genocide uh, of the Tutsi in Rwanda uh, in a much more interactive, reflective way, which promoted active listening and, in a sense, empathic connection uh, toward the development of behavior change and, most importantly, trying to bring together uh, the communities that were at war um, uh, basically a decade ago. So in you probably all of you may know about this, but in 1994 uh, Rwanda experienced a large scale genocide. So Aegis Trust, which is this NGO, UK NGO that uh, worked um, work worldwide really, but engaged with the government in Rwanda since 2001. Um, uh, basically was trying uh, to develop uh, new uh, approaches to bring people together to build a source of new collective memory in the new emerging and young society, trying to avoid that ever this event would uh, happen again. So this, uh, this organization works a lot with archival material and they have developed, uh, you can find it at that link, um, uh, the Kigali Genocide Memorial, which is basically uh, a, a, a web platform with a lots of archival testimonial materials of the rescuer or people experiencing the genocide. And it's a place really for remembrance, learning, uh, so that society can never uh, end up uh, doing the same mistakes. But of course, um, this type of approach, which is uh, actually uh, talking with the Aegis Trust, is a very, very, very common approach of a lot of, age, of NGO of using uh, uh, multimedia narrative and storytelling to really uh, um, teach and learn how to work and live in peace. Uh, it has a lot of challenges. 
Uh, first of all, despite having uh, sort of anecdotal, uh, anecdotal, oh, anecdotal evidence uh, that uh, really video material are incredibly powerful in uh, in, uh, in in sort of uh, uh, developing an empathic connections um, with the event, uh, uh, NGOs don't have a systematic way to understand what is the impact of this video and storytelling um, narratives on the participants that they, they want to train. Uh, also, they don't really know to what extent uh, this experience really changed in some way uh, their capability to think critically about this experience that they may or may not have uh, lived in their own life. And then uh, how, uh, you know, like uh, uh, engaging is this experience from the point of view of the people they train. So uh, this led to basically our um, kind of uh, uh, research project and main research question. Uh, so we wanted to find a way to uh, to systematically promote and measure changes in critical thinking and promoting active listening skill. And, uh, and as I said, trying to move the video viewing to a much more proactive uh, experience. So we used uh, for that democratic reflection, which is a basically a, a audience system feedback technologies uh, uh, that allow people watching a testimonial video to instantly express their inner emotional reaction to what they are witnessing. Uh, after this and from this personal interaction with the video, then the tool creates a sort of blueprints of both the personal and collective experience of the viewers. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and this is used then to generate a series of individual and collective analytics and visualization that can be used uh, both to improve the personal learning and understanding on their own experience from the point of view of the views, viewer, but also could be used by the organization like Aegis Trust to try to understand what is the impact of this video on the, on the people that were watching. So we kind of define uh, or are trying to explain what it is. Uh, uh, it's a sort of uh, nudging technology tools uh, that have, you can see on the right, a sort of uh, small statement that uh, <clears throat> are showed on the side of the video and they are used to nudge or uh, present some reflective uh, um, input source of or stimulus while the person is watching um, in order to have them or present them a different way to approach or to experience uh, the video replay. Uh, democratic reflection was initially designed uh, and implemented and tested uh, in, in the context of political election debate in the last 2015, 17 and 19 political elections. And um, he had shown to improve uh, things like self-reflection and learning and also systematically on a large uh, sample of uh, participants, we found systematic changes in the way people that felt about the political leaders, uh, uh, the, 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 the political debate, and then changed their personal assumption on the, uh, that, that they had before uh, engaging uh, with the with the video of the political debate or the live event. So our main questions was, is it going to work in and how is it going to work uh, in a completely different but uh, very and even most challenging context like the one uh, in Rwanda. Just to give you an idea of the, uh, the user experience that uh, that the people go through. Uh, democratic reflection have a pre-event warm-up stage in which uh, basically um, participants have pre-service uh, questions. They are introduced to the viewing experience. They can have a specific uh, question about uh, demographics or uh, pre um, kind of stance uh, that uh, that the researcher may be interested to observe. 
Then there is the collective watching experience. Uh, so basically everyone watched the video, but with the reflective statement on the side of their computer, iPad or iPhone. And then in the, there is a post event uh, personal device interaction in which uh, each participant receive is uh, sort of uh, uh, personal analytics uh, as a trigger for reflecting on what they have just experienced. And then, of course, there are uh, a wider analysis of, uh, of, the, of the interaction experience with a series of uh, visual analytics that help to understand what happened at group level. So uh, from, the, from the UK testing in the political election, we had some sense that the tool really worked in terms of improving uh, critical thinking and sense making. Uh, it, it supported the reflection and, as I said, assessing and changing assumptions. Uh, we also noticed that there was a very high en engagement. So with all, we tried it with people of uh, all ages with a semi-representative sample of the UK population. So we had a uh, good reason to believe that uh, there is no big usability issue with the technologies. And uh, and so this made us hopefully that could, this could be kind of tested um, in a complex uh, context like the one uh, we discussed before uh, in Rwanda. So, uh, so we tried it uh, with the help of Aegis Trust and the King's College and the SOCO project and we engaged uh, about 60 people um, to reflect on uh, and, and replay uh, a video testimonial called Ubumuntu, uh, which means humanity, which tells the story uh, from the genocide in, in Rwanda. And uh, our overall goal, as we said, was this question, uh, is this tool really going to be able to pro provide uh, a better uh, engagement with this video material and is there a potential to use it uh, for registrars as a way to better understand what's going on in the people they train. So our journey started and it was pretty much um, a very interesting social technical uh, research project in which uh, uh, which started basically with the choice, the difficult choice of the video. So we had, uh, um, we had, of course, all the archival material. So we work with Aegis Trust to put together, um, you know, and choose uh, a video that could be at the same time emotionally engaging, but also informative. Um, we choose this video. I, I don't know if, well, you can access it here, but uh, just to summarize, Oh gosh, I don't know. I is replaying. It was composed of five uh, different video, about 20 minutes uh, with of five videos. Sorry, uh, the first was an introductory video from a university professor providing an historical view of the genocide and highlighting the very serious societal consequences in the overall country. And then it drilled into more focused uh, testimony. First, uh, we have a video. Second, we have a, um, a testimony on women rescuer, uh, pointing out at the women's perspective and struggle in the genocide. The third one was the, the testimony of a nun showing courage and rescuing effort. Uh, the fourth one was an orphanage story, so basically the story of a priest running on orph orphanage during the genocide and uh, bringing the perspective of orphan kids um, uh, to the problem. And then uh, uh, finally there was a, a part, a different type of video snippet that was like flash testimonies by a variety of rescuer. Um, and really giving uh, some uh, snap short uh, emotional statement capturing their personal experience. So um, again, as I said, these were our goal, trying to understand how the video impacted and, uh, and, um, and was it really able to develop empathy. The first big challenge was trying to understand what we wanted to measure. So we had a long and very interesting uh, um, set of focus group 
meetings, um, hour and hour of talks, and then uh, collaborative editing, all to get to this slide. <laughs> and now it seems like silly, but it's like 10 statements which costed us like a lot of refraction. So we built with AGS uh, these two rubric uh, that uh, mostly had the objective to capture uh, exactly the uh, Aegis Trust approach to behavior change, which is grounded around two different uh, uh, capability. First of all, the one of improving understanding, but not just understanding in a knowledge perspective, but understanding as deep awareness and commitment to action. And then uh, the second was the development of personal connections, but again, not only as socialization, but as the development uh, of a, a deeper empathic uh, relationship with what you are watching, with the people uh, and the testament that, uh, that you are uh, uh, looking at. So with the group, we have tried, first of all, we have identified and kind of uh, framed um, their, uh, their uh, behavior change approach in a systematic way. And then we have tried to also interpret it as a process that could kind of help us to systematically capture what does it mean to have different level of understanding and different level of personal connection. So from a very low uh, kind of, uh, of engagement side, for example, in the understanding, um, saying something like she made a big commitment shows a very low understanding in terms of um, awareness and commitment to action that can go kind of slightly strongly deeper uh, in the following sentences. For example, saying, I can do good, has she this, she did, that shows already you're kind of putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Then to a medium understanding, which shows, this show how doing good is possible, which kindly brings you to the realization that you can do something about it. And then a very high understanding, I can be one of them. So kind of uh, uh, bringing in your willingness to act in a similar way and then a very high understanding uh, that says like, OK, I can do it and I can I can practice peace by helping others. So this uh, we basically build a rubric of level of uh, deep understanding and commitment to action that uh, was exactly what Aegis Trust wanted to test and, and, and trying to understand to what extent the video was really helping to realize uh, their, uh, their goal. And the same things for personal connection from a very low personal connection in which people kind of acknowledge that the other person is doing the good things to a very deep, deep connection like emotionally and also uh, like what she's saying in Make Me Proud, which basically uh, shows the highest level of personal uh, connection and empathy. So what we did that, that was uh, the hardest part, I would say. Uh, and then uh, and then the technological setup started. So uh, we did translation of the of the statements into the uh, into the language and then uh, we um, we we started to work well edges trust really work on the on the recruitment uh, and we set up the platform which looks like this so i don't know if i can uh, switch a second to the the browser you can go to democratic reflection uh, org there is a test drive uh, on the on the web page and there is um, uh, where you can access the the Rwanda uh, test drive example, uh, which basically looks a little bit like this. I don't know what's happening. Yeah, so this is basically what people 
would look, of course, in uh, in their language while we are replaying the video. Yes. So you replay the video, and these there are the reflective statements, and uh, you are listening. This uh, some of this really relates to you. You can click on it, and the stronger you click, the bigger it becomes. You can see here there is a heartbeat showing, like uh, giving you a feedback of uh, how you are reacting. And um, and this is basically the very simple like interactive experience you are going through. So I'm gonna pause this. It was just uh, to have you seen it in action, which I think is kind of uh, important. And um, so after we did that, uh, I have now lost my presentation. I know it is the presentation. We uh, divided um, basically uh, uh, this group of 60 people, uh, 44 actually people in uh, in uh, two groups. Uh, one control group that watched the video uh, just on YouTube and the other trial group that watched it with democratic reflection. After the test, which worked like that replay you just saw, um, the tool gives a sort of uh, analytics on the experience. So in different ways, so for example, you can see on the right um, uh, which were the cards that were more clicked and, uh, and uh, in, in, in this case that must have been very difficult, which is actually in the lower side of understanding and engagement in our uh, rubric. Or you could look at the timeline distribution, looking at the peaks of reaction under specific uh, engagement levels in the two dimensions. So um, we have analyzed all the data gathered by democratic reflection uh, and we have run a series of uh, interviews uh, uh, actually with the people facilitating uh, the, the from Aegis Trust and King's uh, College London that facilitated the life engagement with democratic reflection and we found uh, various things. First of all, we found that democratic reflection uh, really changed the viewing experience from passing to more active listening and uh, and uh, and this is, was actually uh, uh, really surprising because <laughs> uh, in this specific context uh, um, our, uh, you know, the practitioner on the field uh, really recorded a sort of uh, not very anti-tech attitude uh, of the people participating. They really did not want to use this tool. Uh, if you have to imagine that in reality, uh, because Aegis Trust had to do a lot of work to involve this group of uh, of, um, of farmer to go to the to the Kigali memorial site and then sit in a room with 20 computers to do this. This was very artificial. Uh, so these people, after all the effort to get there, they really would have just wanted to each other, uh, talk to each other <laughs> and have a physical face to face discussion. So actually we feared that they really would not engage much uh, with this and would not enjoy much uh, the experience um, but uh, uh, interestingly enough from the postdoc focus group and also from uh, the the audience feedback uh, captured by democratic reflection uh, people used it massively so in the in 20 minutes, uh, uh, the group provided nearly 3000 feedback to the video, which is roughly 137 feedback per person. Binar, am I yeah, finished? Yeah. No, no, 10 minutes warning. <laughs> OK, I mean, you can have 10, 12 minutes. No, 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 I'm finishing 10 minutes because I want to have a conversation. So I'm going to just go very fast. Um, so yeah, so uh, this was seven car per minute um, per person, uh, which was really great. Um, also, uh, the tool really developed insights in the overall interaction. So looking at the group statistic, we could see, for example, that overall across the video, the 20 minutes replay, uh, was uh, um, a higher number of understanding feedback 
uh, clicked per to personal connection, but actually then looking at the distribution of the feedback, we realize that uh, um, the understanding feedback, yes, we're higher, but in the lower um, grade of basically uh, uh, engagement with the with the, a more aware and understanding of uh, of the genocide. Um, we also found uh, that we were able to have very detailed insight on the interaction and an in-depth understanding of the audience. So we were able, for instance, to see how uh, the video impacted differently uh, men or women or younger and older people or rural people from the rural or urban area. So just to give you an example, uh, we found that in terms of understanding, we found that youth and parents really differ in the level of commitment to action. And 70% uh, uh, of young people reaction show very high understanding and trust that they could practice peace and help others. Uh, and 7% reaction covered high understanding um, of their active role in, in practicing peace. But then, actually, I don't have the slide here, uh, when it goes to personal connection, the things flip. So basically, we found out that uh, that um, adults that are the people that indeed lived and experienced uh, uh, the genocide had a better understanding uh, of what it entails uh, to build peace. Uh, so even though uh, younger people somehow uh, showed uh, a higher empathic reaction to the problem, they had a, a less understanding of what it gets uh, when they have to really do something uh, to act. Um, the gender comparison was also very interesting, uh, in my opinion. We didn't find any at all difference between female and male reaction, which was comforting. Um, uh, you can see that male and women, they reacted exactly with the same distribution, the same level of feedback. Um, across all the the across all the viewing experience, the most striking finding really was, and the really the only difference that we found uh, that was really fundamental was the difference between rural and urban living. So um, rural participants were five. 56% more proactively engaged than urban participants. Um, so in terms of understanding, uh, um, so in terms of understanding, oh, I can hear my own voice. <laughs> no, Franco is, yeah, yes. That, sorry, um, go on, Anna. Uh, so, so in terms of understanding, rural participants showed a, a higher number of reaction overall and a peak on reaction on the low, so I can do good as she did, but also high under level of understanding, so I can do good as she did. And this is also confirmed by the personal connection chart. So rural participant reached uh, basically, more of the uh, of of overall or the personal reaction, and especially in the very high level, but across all the different level of engagement. So um, basically, uh, uh, we we were able to kind of test and demonstrate that really through the analytics of the data captured by the technology, we really can have a unique insight of how different demographics can react at uh, at the different uh, well to the, to the same video uh, at the same way analytics per video and per narrative also give the possibility to understand difference of the action and use it of to different videos so basically democratic reaction can really be used as a tool for video assessment for ages trust to understand which storytelling uh, and which hypermedia narrative could reach the person they want to reach. Uh, and this can be done also at, 
with an analysis of video by video. So for example, video by video, you could look at how uh, adults and youth uh, react differently, and but also um, comparing video. For example, the, the case of the women's stories is was very interesting because um, uh, this video showed to be much more engaging in terms of personal connection with young people. Uh, in fact, uh, I mean, you can see that the uh, adults uh, show much lower personal connection to the video, video testimony, to the women's testimonial. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you look at what concerns understanding of what entails to build peace, then young people reaction, as I said before, show a slightly lower understanding and awareness of their proactive role. So by looking at those things, what can we deduct and what can AGs Trust do with this information? Well, this means that if they had to choose a video to develop empathic behavior in line people, in young people, this video should have been preferred to the others. Things that we have done with the video by video comparison. In the same way, though, if the purpose was to develop in young people a better awareness or an understanding of what it takes to build peace, this would be not a good video. And there should be used different video, like for example, the video, the first video, um, from the professor, which was more informative and perhaps better adapt for young people to uh, to make sense of what it takes to build peace in a very complex situation. So basically, this is just to give you some snapshot idea. Of course, the analysis is much more detailed, but I hope I give you an idea of how this could be used. Um, also, um, uh, the process was very useful in terms of, uh, of understanding and capturing and building a source of awareness and empathy rubric. Uh, so basically the definition of the cards and what we need to look at to systematically capture engagement with peace building. Um, Still, the statistical test between the AB comparison, you remember I told you that we had two groups. I always talk, or I, I just talk about the 20 people that use democratic reflection so far, but there was another 20 people just using YouTube. Unfortunately, we could not find any statistical uh, difference, unlike in the case of the, of the political election debate between the behavior of these two groups. Now, this is most likely due to the very, very small sample because we only had 20 people, but it could mean something else. It could mean that, uh, yes, uh, democratic reflection is really good for proactive listening and engagement. It's a great tool for assessing the impact of video material for an NGO, but it's not good enough to develop shift in, uh, in, in, in behavior, assumption or thinking like the one that we develop, we, we, we recorded an evidence for political action debate because this is a much tougher and completely different context. So this is all to be demonstrated in the future. Uh, in the future, possibly applying and testing these technologies with a much wider group. So, uh, Dinar, shall I go on or am I done? I mean, you have, if you are finished, then uh, we can take the question and answer. If you have something more to add, then we can go on. I think it's okay. I just want to, let me see if I, I wanted just to, yeah, probably say something uh, more about the future research question that we are interested to look at. So at the moment, uh, we have a lot of uh, interesting question and one of them is to what extent this moment by moment reaction is more authentic of the post hoc reflection that people usually get uh, when they receive uh, post hoc interviews or survey question about an experience they may have. Um, 
uh, we have from previous data from the political debate, we have a theory, a theory kind of shaping which shows that there is a systematic difference between what we capture in one more moment by moment process and the other. Of course, we don't know exactly what is going on uh, and there are lots of hypotheses, but what seems striking is that uh, we are capturing two completely different things, which means that we, if we either go, go for kind of asking post-hoc reflection, we are missing a lot of uh, what is happening in a more kind of uh, uh, immediate and uh, uh, emotional way while people are experiencing the replay of the video. So, um, so our future research will look at this, studying what are these differences, how and why are they caused, and then uh, how can we develop uh, some new hybrid interaction that basically take this is fast and slow thinking and reaction and bring them together to provide a much better sense making and understanding of uh, of uh, of, uh, of complex ex multimedia experience like the one that we um, described today. I think I will finish here. People have the slide. I will be happy to know and have a question and know what people think. Many thanks, Anna. That was brilliant and very insightful and interesting presentation. Um, I will open the floor for question and answer. Uh, you, people can just raise their hands or put the questions in the chat. Uh, I mean, I found it really interesting in the sense there are three areas which I thought it were very interesting for me. The first one was, um, you know, its application in the teaching. Uh, Anna, you you might want to stop the sharing of your oh, screen because sorry. I can see myself. <laughs> That's very unknown. I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, so I, I was just thinking in terms of you know, um, did you 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 know you use this tool first for the political commit uh, communication uh, project, and now you have used this tool for the peace education project. I mean, in both the projects, the there were the different types of audience, different types of communication, in different types of experiences, education, cultural context. So, what does the application of this tool in those two different cultural, you know, total different contexts gives you uh, about the tool itself, and it's 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 sort of a impact on making people aware of you know critical thinking or sense making uh, what what sort of a comparative observation mm -hmm. you have uh, i'm taking this first and but i will take the questions from the people just i'm just yeah. to, to start it off it's a wonderful question dinar i uh, they are very very different um, the difference is there are from multiple perspectives. So one key perspective is people attitudes. Like uh, so. It, when we did the political election debate case, these were citizen engaged, disengaged totally most of them <laughs> in politics. Um, they were recruited by a market research company, paid for that. Mm. And so they were there with no commitment, no uh, kind of, uh, yeah, no motivations. Mm -hmm. So it was like a, a completely dry experience. While uh, uh, the work that had to go in Rwanda through Aegis Trust and King's College to even get mm -hmm. 20 people in a room was gigantic. Mm -hmm. Which means that the people that were there were kind of pre-selected, like okay. the, the cost of engagement were hugely higher because mm -hmm. um, be, and also the sample engage was kind of pre-biased because these were people they already knew that I had already engaged with Aegis Trust that with which Aegis Trust had developed a, a, a sort of a relationship in the past, which also means that there may be a bias there in the sense that I don't know. For example, I said um, I'm doing the devil advocate because these are serious limitations that we have considered. Like um, you, we we have received a lot of feedback across all the engagement. To what extent that was authentic 
or it was just because these are very nice people that have a very big commitment in impressing the organization and then uh, were really, really uh, motivated. Yeah, so the, it was a bit artificial. That makes, I mean, testing, like doing innovative, in, testing innovation technologies with, uh, in developing countries so much harder uh, because of uh, constraint of the place. So it's, uh, it, and, and, and there was also, as I said, a sort of a initial cultural, like, um, skepticism toward technology that uh, may not have been present in the other case, which may also condition uh, the whole experience. Uh, so it, it, it was, it was very different and the way in which you organized and plan and the costs of, uh, of this experience are, are really different despite the fact that the technology works exactly in the same way. So um, yeah, especially as I said, um, this sort of uh, technological uh, perspective and also and the cost or, and potential bias of uh, recruiting selection you know mm. selection and recruitment and uh, and then the third one is i think uh, this uh, yeah this um, very very high cost of engagement mm -hmm. that, that's that's really useful and i will i will wait for people to come up with the question uh, but i can add one more if any of you have the question just raise your hands or you can put that in the chat box. I mean, I also think, you know, it's very useful to look at the application of this tool in the post pandemic environment because there are lots of scope for the education in the sense and, you know, the critical thinking and sense making what happened in the pandemic. And I think the governments will be interested in knowing what sort of approaches might work better in the future. Uh, what sort of communication needs to be there to work better in terms of future? I mean, even the, you know, and that gives it's a, I mean, I'm just thinking top of the head, uh, but I think there is yeah. a good scope for that sort of a project. I mean, I haven't showed that, that slide because I had no time, but one of the main uh, future development will be to kind of uh, decentralize the data structure of the of the tool because we are pretty much aware that we we are collecting uh, sensitive and personal data which can really be um, very insightful into uh, into people understanding uh, so at the moment, of course, the data we keep it private. We have a we are a research institution, but at the same time, there is an increasing, you know, like concern about uh, sharing, you know, personal data with this type of collective intelligence technology. So uh, this project and then another project I'm working on, which is called Because, they are now looking at how we completely decentralize the data. Uh, um, and so that we kind of can prevent misuse. At the moment, uh, uh, this is not the case. So at the moment, uh, so future, when I get more money, <laughs> the first thing that I will do, uh, it will be try to uh, keep people's data safe, basically, because at the moment, yeah, this is like uh, it is quite scary what we what we can infer from the analytics. I just showed you some few few of them, but really because the statements are so uh, precise and so informative and so semantically meaningful, uh, and because the the. the the labeling, the annotation of the data is done by the people, so it's very authentic. Uh, you can be fairly, you know, fairly confident of the precision of your inferences, which is not the case in many other uh, uh, with many other analytical approaches. So this comes with some level of responsibility from the data science side of what we do with this. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, this is another uh, research line that uh, I'm trying to focus on. 
Yeah. Thanks for that, Anna. That was really useful. Uh, if any else, anyone else have a question, do let uh, raise the hand uh, and we'll, I'll take it. Uh, in, in, I mean, one more area where I think this will be useful is uh, something for uh, the students of, you know, we are, uh, we are always interested in making them aware of the critical thinking and challenges associated with it. And I think this can be for part of the, you know, as a case study in the critical thinking or sense making, uh, which we can use it in terms of our teaching materials uh, for at seven, you know, one of the project, uh, one of the module we're working on is researching global development, where there will be focus on critical thinking. And I think this can be really useful there. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I think, I think that would be, I mean, I, I have been asked by all the people, wherever I, I show this in any context, I always get lots of interest from the uh, educational uh, experts. Mm -hmm. thinking that this would be and fit a lot uh, as also uh, a learning to in more formal uh, context yeah learning context uh, you know like a dou or um i have to say for now uh, yeah i have never done it but i would love to do that and to have some use cases in a more formal learning context um for now yeah we have mostly focused it in more like informal learning, mm -hmm. civic learning context, like mm -hmm. in the political election debates or mm -hmm. for peace building education, but in, a, in, in an informal context with NGO, we have never tried it with, uh, yeah, with universities. So that would be a very nice collaborative piece of work we could try. Okay, uh, if we have any more questions, uh, yeah, there is some. Uh, there is a hazel. Go ahead. Hi Anna. Um, oh, sorry, my my camera's over here. I'll Hi Hazel. Find... <laughs> Thanks very much for a really really interesting presentation. Um, so I I was wondering two things, and I may have missed something in in what you said. So forgive me if I have. Um, I was I was interested um, in the urban rural differences in the data and wondered what your uh, explanation is of those. And there are other differences, obviously, too, which you talked about. Um, and uh, but that particularly, I think, intrigued me. Um, but also, I, there is something too about um, about how one explains the differences in general terms isn't it is 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 there is there i suppose what one question is you know is there some theory behind this that offers explanation um or are there things that you have concluded from these data um which suggest explanations um of, of different of differences um so anyway that that was what was kind of running through my head yeah no great great questions so this is why this is a very uh interdisciplinary work that we we kind of do uh in the sense that uh, um for what concerns your first questions you know of a kind of inferences there are two types of inferences so the inferences at domain level so as you said the inferences on what does this mean in rwanda for a rural and urban community in the context of ages trust and peace building and this is something with uh, our col colleagues at king's college basically are working on because they work in peace building and they uh, they have uh, a specific theory i can point you to their work because i know know much about that uh, of uh, of basically uh, behavior changed, which has informed the design of the cards uh, and, and through which, so they have used the technology to test this theory and understand if in what direction basically, uh, you know, they, they, it can be improved. So, uh, so this is pretty much 
kind of a question that I am unable to respond because this is not my research. Uh, but what I can tell you that about uh, the difference in analytical terms is that this type of technology helps you, first of all, to spot I mean, a difference which otherwise cannot be mm -hmm. spot, but any other social science or computer science methods, mm -hmm. because it, it is like a, a very uh, kind of a, a serious problem uh, trying to understand how how complex is the feedback that a person can internally have while watching an emotional video. And the, a part of democratic reflection, before there were no tool for doing this. So I am quite excited by this, but and it shows, so for me, let's put it this way, I have not the domain knowledge to interpret, the findings. This is up to you, <laughs> social scientists, brilliant masters of theories. You know, like I can't, but for me, it's so exciting that uh, I was able to provide uh, an insight for you to be interpreted. So that 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 is my kind of research angle to it. Then in this specific case. Uh, my completely qualitative interpretation of the results, it was that there was a, a, a very um, striking, striking. I mean, the people uh, could not, uh, the intergenerational difference between people, it's not strong. So uh, let's put it this way, like uh, same video, uh, younger and older people from the rural area react in the same way, younger and older people in the city react in the same way, which means that our intergenerational diversity are actually less strong than our mm -hmm. rural local area. So there must be, and I don't know the theory, but there must be some very strong insights in there that tell us that there is something from how we grow up and the experience we make while we grow up in a rural area rather than a, a urban area that makes our inner understanding and emotional reaction to such a rich uh, stimulus much more similar between groups. So it, uh, for me, this is kind of a finding by itself uh, and quite surprising because people tend to think that intergenerational differences are stronger, which probably is not the case because our experiential difference may be stronger. But as I said, I am not, a th <laughs> I don't know about this, so I can't tell you more about what that, that means. But th this tool can provide social scientists with very, very insightful data for uh, have a deeper understanding of their research problems. Thank you. Very useful. Thank you for your reply. I mean, Anna, I have one question more. Um, you know, you see that there are two stages in your analysis, the awareness and commitment to act and empathy. And you have certain statements against when you did the analysis on that. Uh, I'm just curious whether these statements were you, you how, how you come about those statements to you know, so high level of understanding, low level of understanding. Is that something which you, because those are the ones which basically captures, you know, the what people are feeling at that moment in, in a sense. So how, what was the thinking? What was the, you know, the rationale? Or what was the way you developed those? Or these are the people's reaction or these are the statements you made and people were clicking on those? No, these are the statements that Aegis Trust decided to give to the people as reflective nudges. So this represents Aegis Trust understanding and theory of behavior change. Mm -hmm. So they told mm -hmm. us it's completely experiential mm -hmm. based. Mm -hmm. So Aegis Trust works on peace building education since mm -hmm. 20 years. So they have understood that there is a specific theory about how for example, empathic 
empathy is developed. And there are some signals of empathy, which actually are very, shows a very low level of empathic mm -hmm. linking, and some other are very strong. And the connection in the case of the empathy is for them to extent you move from externally acknowledging something to then putting yourself in their shoes, making it yours, and then kind of uh, emotionally feeling it. Mm -hmm. So, and they said that until this goes, you go through the entire process, mm -hmm. then you are not really able to develop empathy. Mm -hmm. So that they gave the rating is through their theory and their practice of this in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. The power of democratic reflection is that it's completely agnostic to mm -hmm. the theory you need to test. We have a methodology to develop it though. Mm -hmm. Start by consulting the groups and then developing with them participatory uh, this metrics, this rubrics. And this, believe me, takes a lot of time. Like it's the hardest part. Then the technological part is quite trivial, I'm telling you. So, but that takes a lot of work, a lot of reflection and a lot of framing of thinking in that phase. But if you get it right, then the level of insight and the usefulness of the data analytics that you get are incredible for what Aegis Trust says, because they were exactly able to measure how the people they train would engage according to their own organizational goals and understanding of people's building education. That's great, Anna. Thank, thanks for that explanation. I mean, there is a question from Gabby um, uh, and she says, sorry if I missed this in your research, but did you know anything about the background of participants, uh, participants taking part? I wonder if conflict displacement, for example, may have influenced the demographics in urban and rural, and this is their experiences. Um, it's a it's a possibility. Uh, it's absolutely a possibility, and this such a big limitation of uh, of uh, of the type of recruiting which is possible in this context because they were inevitably inherently biased these people they were just the people that had enough time resources to be there because this, uh, these are really uh, uh, hard people to engage with so yes it is possible the only thing we know about these people is that um, their gender <laughs> Uh, that they had engaged with Aegis Trust previously. Uh, we don't really know. Well, we do know that they were from conflicting organizations and the Aegis Trust tried to keep a balance of people coming from different communities, um, uh, but not by, gen by, by other demographics. So in a sense, I'm not able to reply to your question, because it is possible, for example, that people all from the same, all from the same conflicting group, uh, I don't know, may have had uh, specific democratic things, other things in common that may have explained uh, this difference. So it, it is possible, and that's why you know, like a kind of. Uh, uh, in order to make any type of uh, uh, statistical inferences, this sample needs to be much larger. The only statistic I've shown, they were purely descriptive. They were statistic for uh, ages trust to basically assess impact and engagement with their community, not uh, and the different videos but not strong enough to make any inferences on really um, kind of a, a pattern of behavior across demographics. We can only show that uh, in these small groups of 20 people, we had a difference, but really I wouldn't push it because there was a lot of uh, bias in the, in the sample, like the one that uh, Gabby well pointed out, I think. Thank you. Thanks. 
Thanks, Anna. Okay. Is there any other question? If not, uh, I will uh, conclude the session. I, yeah, I Gabby, to, go on. Yeah. yeah. Well, apologies, and if nobody else wanted to jump in, I, I, I mean, it's a, it's fascinating. It's a very, very um, different um, approach to 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 kind of looking at behavioural change. So it's fascinating work, Anna. Thank you for sharing that. Um, um, I, I, and again, sorry, because I, I I had to dip in and out a little bit, but I was wondering, um, because obviously you're looking at real time response, and and then the question is, does this, does this turn into action? Um, and and you know and so, and that's a difficult one to kind of look at, isn't it? And I, again, I'm sorry if I missed where you, because I know that isn't exactly what you're looking at now. But uh, but okay. presumably that's the point, isn't it? In a way, it's sort of you know we're all you know we're we're it's like slacktivism. You know we're all very it's everything's very clickable. I feel this, I feel that, I did it. But but and you know um, how does it actually change things in the beyond that that moment? Um, so the way in which we do that, I don't know if you are probably you all are familiar with the Kahneman work about fast and slow thinking. So the idea is that uh, our fast thinking is much more related to our emotional reaction. But until we are able to take our fast thinking and then think upon it, so take the post of thinking and, and reflect upon it, we will never be able to combine them, which means that there may be something we don't understand about ourselves. It may be that our action will be led by conscious perception of our being, which may be actually not true to the very our own self. So, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but you know, like there are lots of people in psychology working on this and uh, democratic reflection is a tool for bringing fast and slow thinking together. So what we do is we allow people to give fast thinking, which believe me, I mean, not in this case, but in the political election debate with all that data, we proved and reproved and reproved. All, all people, when they say they see their personal analytics, they go like, whoa, you know, they go like, did I say that? You know, like, and so our inner reaction, this tool shows that our inner reaction, emotional reaction are so different from what we believe about ourselves or we would like to. So this is a tool to unbiasing, to learning something, first of all, about ourselves. And the way we do this is by taking these analytics, personal analytics, and show them back to you, only to you. The personal one are showed only to the person. So then people, when they see it, it's a trigger for reflection. So, and they go and they think like, ooh. So in the, in the, in the political election debate, we have people saying like, Oh my God, I entered the, this meeting thinking I was a conservative. And then I saw my analytics and I saw, I reacted so positively toward that speaker. I don't know anymore who I am. Other people said like, oh, I had never thought that, you know, like I would be ever be so positive toward the Green Party leader. I better go and check their agenda. So they never found that their immediate reaction matches what their poster reflection. So we have to think every time we give a survey and we make inferences on what people may have reacted to things, how right are we? Are we really spotting what people feel, believe? Are we really spotting what people are going to do in their everyday life? Because Kahneman shows that actually when it gets to action, Fast thinking is much more representative of people actions than slow thinking. So slow thinking may lead to better prediction of your intention, for example, to vote or to act or to do things. But when you get to acting, the big elephant in the room is going to take over. So how good are we doing into analyzing the audience, understanding, protecting, forecasting for what it matters? without recombining this fast and slow thinking dynamics. So this is, well, I mean, this is like my interest in it from a, a kind of HCI interaction perspective, but I think it has a lot of meaning also in general for social science research because 
it is a lot of social science reasons. It is based on understanding people and how they think and act and behave. So I see a strong link uh, in how this, you know, different theories can be combined and different things we could test and study um, that the, the, to, to check if, you know, like if there is something in there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, work. Thanks, thanks, Anna. Um, but most and, and most and everything, I mean, this is my open call to collaboration. <laughs> only the IDII group. Mm. And, I, uh, hopefully we will find a way to do something together. I mean, that was the idea behind this, uh, this present, you know, this invitation and your presentation is just to explore some of the ideas and see where we can go with it, you know, and it's just sort of introducing some of the work you've been doing uh, to the IDI group and IKD, uh, IKD group. And I think this is really fascinating. The, 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 the this tool can be have different applications and, uh, you know, so I, I think there will be some more collaborative work surely uh, going forward, I think, uh, in my opinion. Okay, uh, I can. Uh, this was the last presentation of this seminar series. Uh, again, thank Anna and all the participants for attending. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I really hope uh, you have a good summer and we'll, we'll look forward for you in the next uh, next year's seminar series. Uh, thanks, on. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anna. Bye. Bye.